Damian Lillard's dropping more mysterious hints. Hello, I'm Aaron Fentress with the Oregonian along with Andrew Thien, our podcast editor. We are going to talk about the Blazers. It's the offseason, a lot of activity going on. Summer League just ended. I did features on Norman Powell. There's a couple stories revolving around Chauncey Billups, a new head coach. I got some more stories about him coming up later this weekend. And I wrote about Greg Brown as well. We're going to touch all of those things and a little bit more as we recap a few of the things I've been doing the past few weeks. And we're going to do that with some audio as well. We have some clips from my interviews with Chauncey Billups in Las Vegas that we're going to play for you so you can hear him talk about a certain amount of the topics that we went over while I was with him down and very hot. Woo, man, it was hot. I stayed indoors the entire time. I was not messing around with the heat. How are you doing, Andrew? How are you? Now, everyone should know Andrew's a Blazers fan. That's why he likes coming on the podcast. He doesn't like everything I say about his Blazers, but he comes on to bring some balance to my evilness. Just kidding. Uh, so what do you think about where things are after summer league so far and with Powell coming back and uh, with Dame's comments the other day? Well, Dame's comments the other day, I think, are just more of what we can expect <laughs> from these uh, extremely online Portland Trail Blazers, right, who seem like exactly. they are always uh, on a smartphone and interacting with their, <laughs> with their smartphone. Fans. Smartphone. But, uh, yeah, it's more of what, what, what else can you expect from Dame, right? He's going to, as he said to you. Dame's his own man. He's going to say what's on his mind. And he said, I'm, I'm not leaving PDX yet or not yet right. or whatever he said. <laughs> So, so the other night I'm minding my own business. I'm on my phone and all of a sudden I get this alert. Damien Lillard is going live on Instagram. Wow. Mm. I check that out. I check it out. He's out to dinner with some buddies. He's uh, talking with his friends. He's drinking some wine. He's checking the phone to see who's, you know, popping up and saying hello. Yeah. At one point he had about eight or 9,000 people involved and it dropped down to about four. I think when people realized he was just having dinner, <laughs> we're like, Pretty ah, normal this night, isn't right? exciting. He's, he's not dropping, he's not dropping some bars or releasing a new video right now. <laughs> Uh, but all of a sudden, someone you know puts in the messages to him, "Why are you leaving PDX?" And he says, "I'm not leaving PDX, not now, right now, at least." <laughs> no, it's just like, "Oh snap!" Now, <laughs> I missed recording the audio. I actually was gonna record just in case he said something good, and my recording started right after he started to answer the question, so I blew it. I took a screenshot of him online and I yeah. tweeted about it. Someone else got the audio later. They put it out. Uh, but, you know, it, it, what's funny about it is that when you think about it, in those mm -hmm. short few words, he pretty much summed up what he's been saying all summer. Like, he's never come out and said, I'm out, get me out of here, I'm gone. But he's also not said, I'm committed to the long term. He says he sees himself playing this season with the Blazers. Beyond that, who knows? He wants to see them build a contender. I, I, there's no way they would trade him. Even if he said tomorrow, I'm out, get me out of here, I don't think they would trade him. I think the very earliest it could happen is a trade deadline. More than likely for me, I think it's not going to be till next summer. What did you think being a Blazer fan and a Dame fan? What did I think of the Instagram? I, I mean, I, I think. It, or just where he, where do you think he stands? I think he, he's been very clear. I think everything you just said is like, he's going to roll it out and, and see what happens this season. I mean, he's got, uh, as we've documented on the Blazer Focus podcast repeatedly, uh, this is a team that was pretty banged up last year. Uh, and then, you know, they were healthy when it mattered and they were disappointing. Right. But when they when they were um, together during the regular season with the starting lineup of Dame, uh, CJ, Norm, uh, Covington and, and Nurk, uh, it was a pretty devastating lineup. So, you know, you got to just roll with the bunches, just like any year here with uh, Rip City. Uh, hope, sp <laughs> hope springs eternal. Maybe this is the year. I'm excited for the season. I mean, we're, we're what, right? Like a, a month and a little bit away from preseason action? It's coming up. Yeah, it is. It's, it's right around the corner. It's pulling up too fast on me. That, that schedule came out. I looked at it and I was like, oh my yeah. God, that's a lot of games. Uh, before we get to these Chauncey clips, yeah. let's talk about the over-under which dropped. Now, I was on here with Joe a couple weeks ago. I said, if that yeah. thing's under 50, I'm going over. I'm going to go over. I was on the Sportsbook app, in-state app, and they want like copies of like, your light bill or your gas bill with your name on it and all this kind of stuff. And then they wanted me to with something. Oh, I had to send them a copy of my, my uh, license, I think. And They're I was just like, yeah, best I, interest here. I don't have time for all this right now, but I'm definitely going to drop at least 500 on the over. I think that's a sucker bet. As I've said before, they won 42 games last year out of 72 with Nurk and CJ missing a combined 60. They didn't have Powell the entire season. If Billups is any 
kind of coach at all. He should elevate the defense into the teens. You give me a healthy Blazers team with Powell the whole season with a better defense. How do they not win 50? Well, I say 50. How do they not win 45 out of 82? That just seems almost impossible. That seems like just too easy of a bet. But Vegas isn't dumb. They build those casinos on the backs of people like me. And so the thing you can never count on is the injury, right? I can go in thinking, well, if they stay healthy. Well, when was the last time the Blazers were healthy? Nurkic broke his leg in 2019 before they went to the West Finals. The next year, he missed most of the season. Collins blew out his shoulder. Uh, Rodney Hood blew out his Achilles. And then this past year, Nurk and CJ went down. Dame had his worst month of his career in April because he was all banged up. So those are the things you can't really count on. But would you go over or under that 45 and a half? Well, I'm not a gambling man, but I mean. Okay, if you were it, a gambling it, No, man. I, 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 one of our. Uh, L- L7. <laughs> one, of our, uh, one of our listeners right now says Fentress ain't no fool. Easy bet. And I would tend to agree. <laughs> I mean. With the easy you, bet, with the easy, the easy bet part, they ain't no fool. Which I'll, one? I'll leave it up to you to interpret. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, come on. They're, this team, um, you know, Vegas uh, always gets it wrong, I feel like, with the Blazers. I have no evidence <laughs> of that being true or not, but that's how it feels inside. And right. this is, uh, you know, that's part of the Dame narrative, right? This is a team that's always overlooked, and uh, it's another example of that, um, you know. And especially when the regular season, health or not, is really going to matter for this team. Uh, I think they're going to show up and they're going to be ready. Yeah, Portland's a team, one of the small market teams where the general public is never going to inflate their line. Like teams right. like LA, the Dallas Cowboys, New York, whatever line they have, it's inflated by some percentage because of who they are. That's just like a, a fact about how people pray, or I should say the wise guys pray on the general mm-hmm. public. Blazers are never going to get anyone talking about them nationally. No. They're not going to get anyone out there trying to inflate their number. So that's why you can get some good bets on them for over-unders. I think. Well, this year though, I mean, they are going to be talking about about the Blazers, especially if, you know, as has happened during this, you know, consecutive playoff streak, if they start slow, unlike other years, you're going to have the media machine. Well, watching, yeah, watching Dame, saying, right. Oh, what does this mean for Dame? You know, the Blazers right. are uh, X, Y, and Z, you know, in, in uh, November, what does this mean yeah. for Dame? So that's going to be a different factor this year, but. I don't but that doesn't, that af- but that doesn't, af- that doesn't affect though the preseason over under no. line. No. Once the season starts and that's gone. So, okay. We both agree on over yep. you're, you're, but you're not going to wager. Um, so I, I definitely will. As soon as I can find a dude, I think I dude, I think all the utilities are in my wife's name. Well, two so kids. I, might, two I gotta kids find something. Them. Two kids in daycare, Aaron. That's why I'm not. I'm <laughs> well, man, you can maybe win yourself a month of free daycare. You never know. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. So let's get to the Chauncey Billups interview. I did. Right. I wrote a couple articles. One article was on, uh, him and his plan for next season, mm-hmm. which you can find on OregonLive.com. Another one was on his reaction to free agency. And then I have some a series of, it's either a two part or three part series coming just on him, uh, his evolution and, and journey to, to this, this role. I talked to Larry Brown, his former coach of Detroit, talked to, um, his college coach, uh, Ricardo Patton and some other yeah. people. So that'll be some interesting stuff coming up, finishing, um, finishing up that today. We're gonna start running that probably part one on Friday. Anyway, the first one, one of the things we talked about first, and this was he, he uh, we were in, I met him at the Four Seasons Hotel in Vegas, which was attached to the Mandalay Bay where I was staying. And he actually walks in to the lobby hmm. with, a, with a, a Blazers polo shirt on and golf clubs strapped to his back. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, it's like 100 degrees out. What were you? He's like, ah, I wasn't that bad. We started at 715. He had been playing golf with Scotty Brooks, his new assistant. And then I took the elevator ride with those two up and then went to Chauncey's suite. And we talked a lot about the team. The first thing we talked about right off the bat is everyone wants to know, yeah, how are they going to fix that defense, man? The defense was awful. <laughs> 29th last year. Here's a little bit of what he said about the Blazers and defense. We're going to find out who wants to win, in my opinion, by that level of engagement. You right. Know? Because just we can look at the numbers. We can look at whatever. Offensively, this team was brilliant, you know. Um, and Stotts, he deserves all of that credit. I mean, he he doesn't get the credit he deserves for what they've done here offensively. You know, there's a lot of head coaches around the league that he's an offensive guru, defensive, boom, 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 boom. Nobody ever lists Stotts in that. But he was brilliant at it, you mm-hmm. know. But to go to the next level and be more competitive um, and be more consistent, we got to be so much better defensively. Um, and so I know that. 
that's going to be something that's it's just not going to be an option. Right. You know, to not play hard defensively. Yeah, and that's you know, look. That's what everyone wants to hear. It's not. It's no longer an option. There definitely was a sense last season, even in previous seasons, that defense was a bit optional, and not like you could just decide not to play at all. But you didn't have to be completely in tuned on defense and feel the wrath of Stotts. You mess up a wide, you know, mess up a wide open three. Don't take the three. He might get a little irritated with you. But uh, for, let me get your take first before I elaborate more on what we talked about. Well, it's it kind of brings up. Uh... <laughs> you know, in journalism and talk about pivoting, pivoting to video or something. It's like, Oh, we're going right. to try this new thing called defense. Well, right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that clip was great, Aaron, because uh, here's a man who's obviously very talented communicator where he's both praising his predecessor uh, while also saying like, it's not, yeah. not good enough. His offense was amazing, but man, that defense was bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I, if, if that's not what Chauncey's saying when he's coming in, then there's a lot of <laughs> bigger concerns, but um, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, you got to set the tone, right. As a new leader, when you take over, a, over a position and, um, uh, he's making it clear from the get go and he's got, uh, you know, the guy we'll talk about a little bit later in his corner, the biggest off season signing Norman Powell, who is, you know, that defensive piece. So, uh, you love to hear it if you're a blazer fan. Yeah. I, I thought the best line was, you know, he looked at me and he said, this is how he did it too. We, we're going to find out who wants to win, yeah. you know? And to me, that was directly not necessarily aimed at, but it's talking about who's the person running around saying they want to win mm -hmm. and why they might want to leave town. Well, it's Lillard. Who's one of the weakest links on defense. Well, it's Lillard and, and Chauncey's going to hold Lillard accountable, which, and I'm not saying this like, Oh no, Dame better watch out. <laughs> you know, they got a new principal in town. No. Dame wants that great players. As Chauncey said later in our interview, they want to be challenged. They want to be coached. He was that way. He wanted to be pushed. He wanted to be coached. When he went to play with Larry Brown in Detroit, Larry Brown mm -hmm. said, look, I need you to tone back the, the offensive mentality a little bit, become more of an or orchestrator, both on offense and defense, and focus on being a really good defender. Because if you do that, everyone else is going to follow. And I asked Larry, I said, do you think that that's, you know, what you did with Chauncey is what you think um, Chauncey's going to try and do with Damien. And Larry said, look, I'm no fool. You don't want you don't want Damien yeah. not scoring a lot. You just want him to <laughs> score the ball. But yes, Chauncey's going to be able to have that sort of, sort of impact on a guy like him to, you know, basically communicate to him that, look, you need to give a stronger effort on defense to help the entire team, which takes pressure off of you, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on the offensive end. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. This is going to be the story of the season until it gets fixed. Like if they're the number eight ranked defense in the league, then that stops being a story. But yeah. as they're re repairing that, that's going to be the story. Because if they don't fix the defense, it almost made no sense to fire Stotts because you already had the fourth rated offense in the league. So it's going to be fascinating to see how that evolves as we move forward. As, as Chauncey mentioned in your interview as well, that, um, you know, he, he, there are some good individual defenders in, in Norman Correct. Powell, who's going to be, overmatched in a lot of situations where he's guarding the quiet Leonard's or, you know, these, uh, bigger, uh, power, uh, small forwards, but you know, he, he's going to lean on, um, team defense, right. Improving the team concept. And, um, yes. historically the Blazers have said that that hinges on Nurk being back there, but, um, you know, I'll be curious to see what other tweaks around the edges, uh, beyond just the, the rah, rah motivational stuff, uh, uh Chauncey has in store to, help this team play better D. Absolutely. Okay. And then the next clip is about accountability, right? Uh, Wait. We've got, we got the, the open threes. Open threes. Right? That's next. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Should no, we hit no, the open no. threes next? Actually, actually, no, I, I have accountability here because I was going to uh, mention this in connection with defense. So real quick, um, you, you just mentioned how, you know, the team defensive confidence, our concept and not, you know, rah, rah. Okay. We're going to do all this, but we have to, what, what are the concepts going to be moving mm -hmm. forward to change things? The number one concept is really just going to be want to and desire, I think, because I think the defensive concepts were there. It was just that they were just, they were lazy and a little bit late on rotations, recognizing and picking up things mm -hmm. like, Oh, okay. That guy's open, whatever. As opposed to, Oh God, I got to get over there and make a play. Like there's just little things you can do from an effort standpoint. And that's where he talks about. It's not optional anymore. You have to, bring it and you're going to be held accountable when you don't bring it because you're only talking about like he said this also in my interview he says look we're not looking for lockdown 
Like hardly anyone locks down anyone anymore. It's just making things a little bit difficult, taking away the wide open looks. Don't give a guy a wide open three. Contest it. If you, if you give up 25 wide open threes a game, guess what? They're going to hit 60%. If you give up 15 wide open, they still might hit 60%, but that's far fewer wide open threes that go in that impact the score. So anyway, enough of that. Moving forward to the next thing, open threes. Uh, real quick, the Blazers actually led the league in open threes, mm -hmm. but they were near last or last in wide open threes, and they were near last or last, I can't remember exactly, on contested threes. Go ahead and roll it. We got to do a better job of creating more wide opens. Wide open threes yeah. and corner threes. The corner threes are the best shot in the game. Yeah. We don't want the worst in the league at it. creating that. The only way you do that is get paint touches to drive, right. collapse the D, and actually pass. Well, imagine that. So <laughs> <laughs> actually pass. <laughs> actually pass and paint touches. Is this so one this of the is... teams that's been in the bottom of the league in assists, right? For yeah, I was going to actually, I, I found my list for my article. Okay, so they were 29th in wide open threes. So 14%, 14.6% of their threes were considered wide open, which means someone's four to six feet away from you. Mm -hmm. um, you can compare that to Utah led the league in, with 23.9. So think about that. 14.6 uh, next to last. Clipper or Utah, excuse me, were at 23.9. That's a big difference. Um, they, they, they led the league or their last in tightly contested threes, which means someone's within two to four yeah. feet at 9%, and they shot 34.1, whereas they shot 43.2 on the wide open. So you see the difference in shooting percentage. Yeah. They ranked 28th in drive points, which obviously is something they do not drive to the basket a lot, but they feel Powell can do that really well and we'll talk more about that later. And they were last in both paint touches at 15.4 per game and paint touch field goal percentage, which is 59.4. Almost everyone, well, everyone was over 60, and the leaders were in the high 60s. And the, and the last two, the Blazers ranked 26th in catch and shoot three, catch and shoot points, sorry, at 27.8% compared to the Clippers, who were at 36.6%, the team he just coached as an assistant. Mm -hmm. And then Lastly, they were last, dead last, and assists at 21.3. And what all that points to, and we've all watched the Blazers play, there's just too much. Bring the ball up. The guy's two feet off me. I'm open. Shoot it. <laughs> Trent was doing that. Simons was doing that. Dame definitely does that. CJ does that. And the thing is, they were pretty good at it. I mean, they had a right. really good offense. They would hit a lot of those shots. Right. But what Chauncey wants is, let's take that shot when all else fails. Let's not take that shot within 10 seconds of the shot clock. Let's get some pain touches. Let's attack the basket and kick it back out. Let's get Nurk involved in the high post. And he, we all know how good of a pass here he is. Right. Let's, you know, give, give Nurk the ball maybe. And then Dame was running around to get open off the screens and getting wide open looks. Let's just move the ball more. So it's going to be amazing, I think, from an offensive standpoint, to see this team do that more often. And I, I give credit to a lot of fans who are down on Stoss despite the offensive production. They, they, they would always say, we're just too simplistic. We're just relying on these threes. Right. We need to have more ball movement, have more player movement. And they were right. And Chauncey wants to do that. And that was something that was a hallmark um, of the early Dame teams, right? And when you look at the the Dame and, and Wes and, and Batum and Aldridge. Yeah, I mean, Aldridge, there, right. There was a lot more ball movement, I think. And um, I think maybe for uh, like with anything in life, when <laughs> there's been some bad habits established, but the bad habits can lead to good buckets, I guess, or good results when you've got Damian Lillard and uh, CJ McCollum being able right. to create their own shot in isolation. But yeah, when I hear that clip, um, I get excited as a fan for the prospects of uh, what really was most exciting for me was watching Nurk and Powell kind of interact. These are two guys that I think will be uh, simpatico. <laughs> they can really feed off one another. Um, that was something that I, I got really excited about towards the end of the regular season. It didn't really play out as much in the playoffs as, as I kind of had hoped. So I think, you know, getting the ball into the paint, like you said, at that elbow, kind of the, the Mark Gasol land <laughs> right, for, right. for Nurk, I think that's, that's exciting. And then if you have uh, a Norman Powell, CJ, Dame all out there, or Covington, who, as we've seen, when he gets hot, he can get really hot for extended periods of time then you right. can go completely dry for a while but um i you know I'm, I'm excited to see what kind of tweaks around the edges are there and hopefully a healthy use of nurkic because 
if he's healthy, it's that's, been a while. That's, Think about that, man. It's been a while. Yeah. It's, you know, I'd be curious in looking at the assists uh, ratings, um, and it's hard to project, right, when he's been so unhealthy. <laughs> but like, what is a seventy games of Nurk look like in terms of assists per game? I don't know. We've never seen it. I don't think. Right. That's a good point. Uh, as far as like you mentioned back in the day, there was probably more ball movement. You know, when Dame came into the league, I think they were shooting 23, 24 threes per game. Yeah. And then when they, as, as, as they started evolving, as, he, as Dame started evolving as a three point shooter, and then Stott started saying, let's shoot more of them. This past year, they shot 40.8. So if you're shooting 17 more threes per game than you were back then, some of those are not necessarily the product of ball movement, right? So it just shuts down that part of your game. But yeah. Billups wants to still shoot a lot of threes, but do so after moving the ball around. He made a comment. Uh, to someone a couple of weeks ago where he said, I'm not, I'm not a guy who likes jack up 53s. Right. And some people freaked out. Some website wrote an article, the headline, Dame's not going to like this plan or something like that. I'm like, first of all, how do you know Dame's not going to like it? Yeah. Second of all, you're not listening to what he's saying. He's not saying he doesn't like to shoot threes. He doesn't want to jack up a bunch of threes. A jacked up three is I just came down and just jacked it up. <laughs> That's not cool. moving the ball around. Now I got a good shot and I took a good shot. He wants great shots. So, uh, and, and here's another thing too, man. Like we're not talking about, just gigantic, huge changes that have to happen. The difference between the 29th rated defense and the 10th rated defense was four, I think four, four and a half points per a hundred possessions. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about per a hundred possessions, finding three more stops, right? On offense, they averaged, they were, they were fourth in, in rating. I think they averaged 118 points a game or something like that. You know, if, if you move the ball around and get better shots and your, your shooting percentages tick up a couple points, you may only score four more points per game. Right. But if you score four and you allow four or less, that's an eight-point swing. That's an eight-point net rating swing. That gets a team from 42 wins to 53 wins. So, and it's just attention to detail because you're going to get lit up by teams. There's good offenses. You're going to get shut down by teams. There's good defenses. But over the totality of the season, if you're a plus eight net rating better than you were last year, you're a three seed. You're a four seed. So that's what they're shooting for. Well, maybe that's a good way to tee up uh, the next clip, Aaron, which is kind of how, how do we, you asked Chauncey effectively, how do you stop Dame having to be God mode, right? And this right. Is, this, <laughs> this is what he said. Okay. And he's going to have some of those nights where it's just, he, he has it going. Yeah. yeah. You know, we got to ride it, but that can't be where our season lives and dies. Right. right? Know, it's just too hard. It's too much pressure on him. Yeah, it's too much pressure on Dane. Like it's just too much pressure on them dudes uh, to play that way. We we, we got to be better. But also, you know, I'm really excited to have Cody Zeller there. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about him next. Like I'm really I'm excited to have him. Uh, a big, you know, that is, is gonna be good defensively for us. Right. But not only that, he plays with with a very high IQ. Plays hard as heck. Um, really good facilitator when he catches it on short rolls and stuff yeah. like being able to read the back line defense you know those things are going to be important you know yeah. for us and how and how we're going to play cody zeller changing the franchise's <laughs> future baby who knew it <laughs> hey well he's got those read those back lines he got some zeller to Derek jones jr uh lobs in our future maybe on the second unit that was surprising yeah. i wasn't anticipating that that was an interesting answer you know, look, I, I, I haven't watched much Charlotte basketball, and by much I mean zero Charlotte basketball over the years during the Cody Zeller era. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those signings where, you know, the average person is going to be like, Cody Zeller, like, what does he do? <laughs> well, you know, you have to be fair and go look at what he does. And I, I went and I watched some video of him, and he's a skilled big man. He's not an all-star. He's not a guy you want starting playing 35 minutes. But – defensively on the perimeter if you watch him when he gets you know he gets switched up on he's you know he's not going to guard paul george or kevin kevin duran open field open court to open field football open court but he at least on most guys is going to be a little difficult to get by because he can't actually move his feet unlike Cantor. also he can pass very well there's some good clips of him in the high post getting the ball and guys are cutting he's finding him with bounce passes etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is a nice subtle move as a backup who has similar skills in Nurk, but at a different level. And he's a backup. And the fact that they know now that when they go from Nurk to their backup center, it's not going to be a complete change in skill set like you did from Nurk and Cantor. And you're going to get some defense. Again, that's one of these subtle things that maybe it makes your net rating 
just two points better because the defense is there. Yeah, the concern, of course, is that all sounds great, right, Aaron? <laughs> but, the, but this is a guy who what's what's his main knock, right? I mean, he's injury prone. I know. Uh, so that's I know. that's where the you know the hair on the back of your neck goes up as a. I know. A you just gotta hope they're not both injured at the same time, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's turn to Zach. Co- oh, oh, Zach oh, Collins. God. Is that's um, the biggest disappointment. What about Moses Brown? Uh, uh, he's gone uh, too. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, the the thing though, I mean, I'm old enough to remember. Cody Zeller was that big athletic white dude flying around in Indi- Indiana, right? I mean, yeah. he was a he was a talented player. Um, I think most uh, you got to be kind of up until last year. I didn't watch any Charlotte Hornets. I I did have the uh, opportunity to watch them with Lamelo, and it was Lamello, super, yeah. super fun. But I'm right. not gonna lie, like Zeller didn't jump off the TV or the screen to me, but. I was mostly enamored with with uh, Lamella, who was pretty exciting. But hey, yes, I mean, we're I'm excited to see how how this re- reworked defensive unit plays out. Yeah. Now we we didn't run the clip of my conversation regarding Macklemore and Snell, and what what Billups said about those two is, and this ties into taking pressure off a of Dame. So they want Dame to give more effort on defense. Mm-hmm. If that means fewer minutes, or that means you even catch a couple fouls and then you have to sit a few minutes because you're in foul trouble early. They wanted guys who they could plug in along with Simons who give you shooting mainly. Cause again, they want to work the ball around, right? If you're working the ball around, let's, let's say Dan gets a couple fouls in the first half or first quarter because he's being aggressive on defense. He's going to sit three or four minutes longer than he would have. Okay. So now you've got McCollum and Powell at the guards. You're still pretty good there. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe Macklemore's in, maybe Snell's at the three or what have you. Those guys can shoot the lights out, especially Snell. Macklemore had a down year shooting last year, but they believe he definitely is a sharp shooter, especially if you get those wide open looks. And so they feel like having that extra veteran guard and wing play shooters like that is going to take a little pressure off of Dame and CJ in the long run. So we'll see how that works out again. Not sexy names, but if you just look at their specific skill set and yeah. what they're going to be asked to do, then they fit a role. It's sort of like, let me, let me give it now. It's sort of like, you know, people who follow baseball, sometimes your, your team picks up that, outfielder who only hits 250 mm-hmm. right but he's a great defensive replacement right and he sh- hits well in the clutch so no he's only he only make 1.5 million he's not gonna be a star but eighth inning you gotta put him out there and play some defense in center field and get someone out of there he, he adds value and that's sort of what these guys are gonna do in little niche spots they're gonna add value and take pressure off damon cj in theory yeah i think people who have watched the Blazers over the last, you know, during the Dame era or even the last few years. Tony Snell's one of those guys who always, I feel like, plays well or has played well against the Blazers. Um, he was on your team. He was on the Bulls, but uh, I don't know what what you made of him. But um, All I, I can do is shoot. <laughs> yeah, I remember feeling, uh, you know, just kind of suffocated as a Blazer fan watching him when he was on the Bucks. you know, that long team, all these guys. And here's this guy. Tony Snell hitting these timely shots. So, I mean, if he can play that role at all, uh, that'd be huge uh, for this team. Yeah, if, if his only job, and he's a decent defender, so if his only job on offense is to wait for someone to kick it to him, and he's out there with, he's going to be out there with either C.J. Norm, Dame C.J., Dame Norm, 90%, you know, most of the time, because some combination of those three is going to be on the court the vast majority of the game, and then Simon's obviously is going to work in there. And if that's his job, well, obviously you have to, pay attention to CJ and Dame. So if you double one of them, somehow Snell's going to be wide open. And yeah. for if you start, if you made a list of all the players in the NBA that you do not want to leave absolutely wide open, Snell's pretty high on that list. He shot 50% last year, albeit on only hundred something threes, but still 57%. He's a career 40% shooter. It's just a nice little ad and we'll see how it works out. Of course it's, it's you know, everything looks good. Well, not everything looks good in, in August, but it, to, for me, I think given all that, all you had were the minimums to, to spend on these guys. They got some nice guys who are going to fit what they want to do. Okay, so yeah, next up, yeah. yeah, we got one more. This is on John C. talking about Norman Powell and how important it was to get him back and how he envisions using him. The leadership <laughs> on the in, in the gym is going to be different, you know, with myself and any head coach coming in. So. Right. I can't even worry about what happened last year. I got to just talk about what I see and what I what I envision yeah. him being with Norm. And that's, my talks with him was all about that, you know, not about what happened before, because um, that didn't have anything to do with me. Right. But what I seen and what I envision going forward. 
I kind of cut down a little bit of that conversation. So maybe you can enlighten us a little bit more, Aaron, on on what else uh, Chauncey said uh, about Norm. I guess my inference was like maybe he didn't feel as included in the offense as he as he did in Toronto. Yeah. So, he, you know, he said to me that in Toronto, he knew where his shots were coming from because he'd yeah. play there so long. So you're in the flow of the offense. He comes to Portland. He's got to fit in. He's got to fit in a situation where he's playing with two ball dominant, shooting dominant guards and Damon CJ. Not that he didn't have, I mean, he had Lowry and Van Vliet right. over there, but again, he had played with them. Right. So he was trying to learn a new system, learn teammates. And he never found a comfort zone and his, his numbers, his overall numbers, Production wise, we're fine, but his shooting percentage has dropped. Like he went from 44% on threes in Toronto to 37 in Portland. And part of that, he said, was just comfortability. Now, one of the things they love about him, and this goes hand in hand with the idea of more penetration, more getting to the basket, more attacking, is that that's what he can do. Mm-hmm. He, if you, the best two players on this team by far at beating someone off the dribble, attacking the basket, and having some type of athleticism to make something happen at the basket are those two, are Dame and CJ. Or excuse me, sorry, Dame and Powell. Right. Because Powell has, Powell has like really top tier athleticism and bounce and quickness and, and a, a shot repertoire to go with that and long length to get to the basket with those arms. So he wants to, and they want him to be one of the guys who's going to attack attack the rim, get in the paint, draw the defense, kick it back out to Snell, kick it back out to CJ Dame, whoever he's on the court with, get those wide open threes, or he's going to win at the basket. Uh, And he's going to get more opportunities to do that because they want to move the ball around more. They want to give people different opportunities to do things offensively instead of relying so much on Dame and CJ. So that's sort of along the lines of what uh, Billups was alluding to and what Norman expects. Yeah, I'm curious if you talk to him at all about this, Aaron, that like, I mean, he was coming from Toronto, but he was also in Tampa last year too, right? I mean, like, so he's in Tampa is where the, the Raptors were playing their home games. Oh, Tampa. yeah. Like, and so he's doing that, and then he's coming to Portland. Like, he's, you know, I'm wondering if the comfort, uh, comfortability, that's a weird word, com- the comfort <laughs> factor, uh, you know, when you're bouncing around a lot, whether just being here full time, that, you know, I would imagine that pays dividends as well as the – you know, the assurances from a new head coach that like you are going to be a instrumental piece here as well right. as, as you've reported Dame calling him right. And saying like, we need you here. We need you here. Exactly. And you know, he came here for a couple of months. He knew he was going to be a free agent. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things hanging over your head, plus a new team adjusting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to deal with now. He's got his 90 million. He's got a five year deal. He's Ooh. here in Portland. He's going to buy a house. You know, he's going to, he's got two pomp ski dogs, which are his BFFs, BFFs, excuse me, Odin and Apollo. Uh, he says he's a homebody. He said, you because know, I asked him about, you know, Portland struggling to, uh, to get free agents and mm-hmm. guys who want to be traded here. And he's like, For- Portland fits his vibe. He likes the outdoors. He likes quiet and serene. He's not a guy who wants the, the bright lights of the big city. So it's funny because you're, you're three most important players. And I do think Powell, well, I, I think, okay. Nurk's your third most important player because of this position. I think Powell's a better all-around player. Yeah. But th- these all three of them are content living in a place like Portland, which are the guys you're kind of trying to find, right? So, no, he's going to be completely comfortable now. He knows he's a big part of this team and its future, and he knows that chance he's going to put things in to take advantage of his skill set, which is going to make him be more comfortable. And I'm telling you right now, man, if that guy is shooting 40% and Dame's shooting 40% from three yeah. and CJ's shooting 40 and McLemore – and Sneller coming off for 40, and Covington hits 38 again, like he shoots at 38 like he did last year, and you have Nurkic all season in the in the post and passing and doing all the things he does, they're going to be a really, really difficult team to beat for anyone in anyone in the NBA, like, except for a healthy Nets team. I think they're pretty much untouchable. But I, this is why I think the Blazers are going to win 50, because that's a pretty damn good lineup. It is. Um, well, you've been super busy lately. Um with filing all these features um, without <laughs> giving too much of, of, uh, of the store away with your pieces coming this weekend on Chauncey. Um, is there anything else that you learned about him that uh, was <clears throat> revealing or super, or just, you know, interesting about like how he approaches uh, being a head coach? Yeah. You know, I thought the most fascinating thing was he referenced a lot to understanding what he doesn't or, or or understand or knowing that there's a lot of things he doesn't know and a lot of things that he doesn't even know he doesn't know yet right he's new to this and so he wasn't afraid 
to surround himself with more experienced people like Scotty Brooks, who's been a head coach, I think, for 12 years, been to the NBA finals. You know, Brooks is a legitimate NBA head coach who he has as his right hand guy. And he's going to listen to him because he knows that Brooks has been there, done that. Therefore, naturally, Brooks is going to have some uh, expertise to offer him. Mm -hmm. And Larry Brown, who I spoke with and his college coach, Ricardo Patton from Colorado, they both said that one of the things they like about what Chauncey has done and one of the things they like about Chauncey, why I think he's going to be a coach, he's just that kind of guy. He doesn't let his ego get in the way to the point where he's like, it's my way or the highway. I want it done, done this way. Even if, when he, he may not be as, you know, up to speed on what exactly he's even trying to do. He's not afraid to lean on other people. And if, if Scott Brooks says, hey, Chauncey, here's what you need to consider if you're going to do this, Chauncey's not going to think, well, I made the decision on the head coach. He's going to think, damn, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. And then he's going to ride with that. And so Larry Brown was really big on this because he says, Larry Brown says, that's how I was. And I think Chauncey learned from Larry Brown about how to be more co-opted with your, your coaching staff and learn from the people who have something to teach you. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I love about basketball is the, the team, uh, you know, the, the unit really, really, I mean, it matters in every sport, but when there's only yeah. five of you, uh, you look at, you know, obviously Chauncey was the MVP of the finals on a championship team. That was a team that was, uh, filled with extremely talented players. Uh, in, you know, you think of Rashid Wallace, who's the best player on a team for a very long time. Um, Rip Hamilton was a 20 point scorer for much of his career. Um, you know, Ben Wallace was a defensive player of the year. Right? Of, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then you've got, like you mentioned, Larry Brown, who's a, a legend. Um, so to navigate that and be the undisputed leader and the finals MVP, uh, you, you got to have some uh, people skills, I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. And those are the things he, that the Blazers believe are going to help change this team and what Neil O'Shea believes is going to be a difference maker for the squad. One, one quick thing uh, we talked about um, how he ended up with the Clippers. <laughs> so Chauncey was in the final year of his deal with the Knicks making 14 million and they amnestied him, uh, which means if another team picks him up, they bid on him. And then however much that team's going to pay comes off of the 14 million that the Knicks owe, they still have to then pay the rest, but it comes off their cap. Right. Uh, they, they put this in for a lot of teams to get out of some bad contracts and things like that. But anyway, so Chauncey thought he was going to clear amnesty waivers, and then he becomes a free agent. He was going to go to Miami and play with LeBron, Wade, and Bosch. And this was the season that they won the title after they – or this, they would have been going for their second straight, I think. 11-12 was the season, so they're going for the second straight title. So it's a chance for Chauncey to go and win another championship. And then 15 minutes before the deadline, he gets a call from his agent and said, the Clippers scooped you up. He's like, what? He knew that the Clippers had already made a trade for Chris Paul. So he's like, why are they messing with me? So he was a little irritated, but then he got over it. I'm going to go play with CP3. I'm going to go play with Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan. And, of course, the man who blocked him from going to Miami and brought him to the Clippers was Neil O'Shea. Interestingly enough, seven months later, O'Shea becomes the GM with the Clippers. So it's one of those things where, excuse me, with the Blazers. Yeah. So it's one of those things where Chauncey probably got robbed of an opportunity to win a title with the Heat, but that relationship he, he forged with Neil in LA had a huge part. He was played a huge factor in him nine years later, be, later becoming the coach of the Blazers. That's pretty interesting piece of NBA history there. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like that was a long time ago now, actually. It was, it was nine years ago, ago, man. Think about that. Or no, 10 years ago. Um, so what I, I want to talk about Greg Brown a bit, but uh, ask you a little sure. bit about Norm Powell first. Cause, um, yeah. I mean, he just seems like you mentioned the dogs, which, uh, in your feature that kind of leapt out to me. That was, <laughs> you know, he fit, he'll fit right in. We love dogs here, but, um, <laughs> yeah. he just kind of seems like a kind of a goofy guy. I don't know. Isn't he like a Harry <laughs> Potter fan too? Right. Yeah. Uh, um, He's an interesting character. <laughs> Did you, did you feel like, I mean, it's hard to talk to people over the phone during a pandemic yeah. anyways, but you feel like you got to understand his personality a little bit better. Yeah. Just a little, just, especially when he was, when he was talking about, um, you know, loving nature and he, he, he looks forward to getting out and exploring this area more. And, and when he, when he first came to Portland, he stayed in a hotel one night and then they put him up in uh, the home where Kent Bazemore used to live. 
and it was on a lake and he could walk out on his back porch and there was this beautiful lake there and he was just like, ah, I can just relax. And that's just more his speed. So I thought that was interesting um, that he's just, you know, he's all about his dogs and hooping. That's yeah. it. I remember Channing Fry loved the nature aspect too. So it's good to have another blazer who, who's into that. Um, Summer League, you got to go, had to go. <laughs> uh, I went primarily to speak with Billups, not yeah. for summer league, but since I was there, I went to a couple of summer league games. Yes. What do you make of Greg Brown? Is this guy that we're going to see much? I mean, I I think I shared a link to his. Uh, he, he's got this ha hedgehog fam, which I don't know right. what this is. This is his brand or something, know, yeah. and he's making T-shirts yeah. uh, of him dunking with the skyline in the background. So he's an entrepreneur. Got to love yeah. it. Yeah. Smart kid. Uh, this, you know, this is an intriguing guy. Like, we, because he, one, he's someone who coming out of high school was a, considered a top 10 player in the country. He goes to Texas. Uh, a lot of people think he's going to be a lottery pick. Because if, if you go, if you ever go look at lotteries mm -hmm. picks and you look at previous top 10 rated players in the country, they line up a lot of times, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but he didn't have a great season at Texas. He has issues with shooting, although the Blazers feel like his shooting can, can tick up a bit. And he also had some maturity issues. He got into it a little bit with uh, Shaka Smart. He he tried the same dunk he did the, uh, a couple weeks ago in the game where he went between his legs and dunked. He tried that in the game against TCU and missed it. And he, he felt the wrath of Shaka Smart. And then the next game, something happened, and he got benched, and he got ticked off and started to walk away to the tunnel and then but came back mm -hmm. um, after, before going all the way to the locker room. And then he ended up getting benched and only played six minutes and won the tournament games or something like that. And then, of course, he leaves and goes pro. But he talked a lot himself about, I need to grow up. I need to mature. And he's learning a lot from – or he learned a lot from like guys like Moutier and Beasley and uh, Kenneth Ferry, who are veteran guys with a combined – and Antonio Blakely. I think – Blakeney, I think they have a combined 21 years NBA experience. Yeah, totally. So he recognizes a lot of things he needs to do to become a professional – and in terms of developing a, a better work ethic and attention to detail. But my God, from a physical standpoint, 6'9", long, rangy, he eats up space with his legs like that and an explosion to the basket. Name the last time the Blazers have had someone like that. Batum, you have, do you have to go back to Batum? I, well, yeah. I mean, I guess I guess Hood before the Achilles was pretty explosive, but he wasn't 6'9". I'm talking about someone over 6'8", with that type of athleticism, just raw, natural athleticism. It's hard for me to think of anyone. Can you? No. There might I mean, be someone right in my face. I'm not thinking of, but Luke Babbitt comes to mind. Uh, no, I'm joking. I'm like, uh, is he serious? Uh, Wait, I'm not, I'm not let me serious. Google Luke Babbitt dunk. <laughs> I'm trying to. I mean, Thomas Thomas Robinson was not that tall, but when he came out, yeah, six he was, five, six six. He was, yeah, he was uh, explosive. I was enamored with his athleticism. Um, yeah. But he, you know, for a number of reasons, didn't pan out. Will Barton, obviously, pretty athletic guy, but not on the Again, same six five. Yeah. Level with. Yeah, I was trying to six, think five, of six, a six. comparison. And he's a lefty too, right? Greg Brown? Yes. Or he likes to dunk. I'm, is left. he? I've only seen him dunk. No, I've I thought him shoot. Maybe I watched not. him shoot. I thought he was shooting righty, but I could be wrong. Hey, well, uh, he can dunk well. He can dunk well. Yeah. So my story that I always go to when, you know, talking about athleticism being overrated is Tyrus Thomas. Because the Bulls draft, the, I always go back to Bulls stuff with basketball. It's just how I am. Well, but Marcus it's a Blazer connection. Exactly. The Blazers sat down with lunch with Lamarcus and felt like Lamarcus, Lamarcus wasn't tough enough mentally. They didn't think he had enough dog in him. So they traded with the Blazers, gave the Blazers Aldridge, and, and took Tyrus Thomas, who had that dog in him allegedly, and was an athletic freakazoid. The problem was he couldn't play basketball. So just being athletic is not going to make you star. But when you have that type of elite athleticism and you yeah. get him in the second round, right? If you can mold him at all, you're going to have something. You're going to have a rotation player. You're going to have a piece. You're going to have something. So I, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how he develops. The problem is there's not going to be many minutes on this team at forward because you've got little, you've got DJJ back there backing up at the three, which is going to be a power spot. And then, of course, you have Covington play the four. They don't really have a backup four, but I can't see them giving too many minutes to Brown at the backup four. That would be kind of a mismatch as far as I'm concerned. Um, but we'll see what happens. At the very least, though, definitely going to be fun to watch. Hedgehog fam. Google it. <laughs> I don't know what it means. It? I, want, I want you to figure <laughs> out what hedgehog fam means for me, and we can talk about it. <laughs> okay. Day. I'll but get that, right on that. But, uh, no, thanks for all the great uh, stuff that you've been filing all summer. And uh, it sounds like people should check in this this weekend, OregonLive.com slash Blazers. 
for the latest. yep it's gonna, either gonna be a two-part or a three-part feature on uh, sort of his evolution uh from player to where he is now great all well, right. That's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> well, uh, all right. Till next time on the Blazer Focus podcast. Again, I'm Aaron Fentress along with Andrew Thien. And we'll try and drag Freeman on here again at some point. He ducked us this week with some some lame excuse. We'll give him crap about that. Let me ask you a question. You play basketball with him. How's his basketball game? He's pretty oh, good, right? Yeah, Joe's a good player. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. played in high school. Is he is he a shooter? Oh yeah, he's a shooter. Yeah. You can't leave he, him open? Uh if you if you leave him open, he'll make it. And then if you run at him, he'll fake and he'll he'll drive. He's, he's he'll a, take it to take it to the rack. He's a multi-tooled uh, prospect. Yeah, nice. He's got game. Freeman's <laughs> got game. I always figured he did. All right, that's it for this edition of the Blazer Focus Podcast. Be sure to click the subscribe button and give us a five star rating. We'd appreciate that, and we will see you next time.